more than just a trumpet virtuoso improvising flights of lasting power, he had become an irresistible performer, the only musician ever to influence the music of his time equally as singer and instrumentalist. Oh, well, his singing was wonderful. And not only that, he was the what we call the scat singer. Louis was the first one to do that. Now, he was on a record date once, and he was holding up a sheet of music to read the words to the song, dropped the sheet of music, and, and he didn't want to ruin the record, so he went on to sing. Re-bop, de-bop, de-bop, de-boom, you know, scat singer. because we used to do that in the quartets in New Orleans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like an instrument or something. Louis Armstrong singing and scatting was something new to Chicago, the people in the public in Chicago. But that's an old New Orleans way of uh, entertaining that was done in New Orleans way before. I imagine Louis was doing that in Chicago, I mean in New Orleans, because that's really a New Orleans way of uh, singing, scatting, and, and, and they're still doing that down there. And well, this was sort of new. Well, Louis was was uh, was a creating. He was a, he was creating so much. His beginnings could not have been less promising. Abandoned by his father at birth, Louis was brought up in a red light section of New Orleans so riddled with vice and violence it was known as the battlefield. All that remains of Jane Alley today is a tree protected by a brick wall around which the modern city of New Orleans has sprung up. He always insisted he was a child of the American century, born July 4, 1900. In truth, he was born August 4, 1901, as shown by the baptismal registry of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Church. His mother, May Ann, was devoted to Louis and to his younger sister, Beatrice. Occasionally, May Ann took her children out of New Orleans to the sugarcane fields of Bouti, 70 miles west of the city, where her family had once worked on the plantations and where they enjoyed a sense of community that would stand Lewis in good stead for the rest of his life, as Armstrong later recalled. One thing about May Ann, everybody from the church folk to the Lord gave her the greatest respect. She never envied no one or anything they might have. I guess I inherited that part of life from me and. All his life, Armstrong would write, talk, and sing about the joys and horrors of growing up in New Orleans. You get those badgers ringing the darkest thing over, and this brand silly break of day. Give those Southland with a dreamy song. Take me back. Where I belong, right in my mammy's arm, when it's sleepy time down Lewis was reduced to stealing from produce barrels to help put food on the table. His future seemed circumscribed from birth by racism and poverty. But even as a small boy, his irrepressible personality made him friends. A neighboring Jewish family put him to work with their sons, selling coal to the prostitutes in Storyville. They brought him home for dinner and taught him to sing lullabies from the heart. And they enabled him to buy his first cornet. He taught himself the blues, but he hungered for lessons. It either was a New Year's or a Christmas one. Everybody was, <laughs> was shooting firecrackers. <laughs> and Louis got a, got a gun and, and shot the <laughs> And instead of lighting a firecracker, Louis, pow, 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 pow. <laughs> and so they put him in at home. When he got in there, they had a music teacher in there. That's when Louis learned how to play the trumpet. The Colored Waif's home was founded by legendary Southern educator, Captain Joseph Jones. Its music professor soon recognized a prodigious talent in young Louis. There was a teacher there by the name of Mr. Peter Davis. It was for a long time before he'd even Look at me, you know what I mean? Because from the neighborhood I came from, yeah. you figured I was one of them bad boys too, you see? Mm -hmm. So anyhow, one day Mr. Peter Davis 
come and he made me the bugler mm -hmm. of the institution and he showed me how to blow the bugle and uh, watching Joe lift the horn and different thing and, and I made all the calls. And when I got out, I went right into Joe Oliver. So quite naturally, he was in my life. I used to run errands for his wife, Miss Stella mm -hmm. Oliver, and Joe would give me lessons. And I was always there when she gave me his red beans and rice. <laughs> I think the reason that Louis Armstrong really loved New Orleans is that when he was growing up in New Orleans, it afforded him all of the, the experiences that one could want if you were going to be an artist. He could come in contact with people from all walks of life and have an exchange with them. And then there was opera in New Orleans and, and a hierarchy of older musicians who looked out for the younger musicians and made sure that they would practice. In 1918, 17-year-old Lewis began to claim he was a year older. That was the year King Oliver left for Chicago, and Lewis was chosen to replace him in the city's hottest band. He played in the talks, in street parades, and at picnics at the posh lakeside resort known as the West End. He also married a prostitute and legally adopted a retarded cousin he would take care of all his life. He began playing on the Mississippi River boats under the tutelage of fate Marable. At every stop along the way, Marable drew crowds by playing the calliope on the upper deck. Armstrong's reputation spread as far north as Davenport, Iowa, as young musicians, including Bix Beiderbecke, heard him play on the steamer. Soon, King Oliver wired him to come to Chicago. I just had left the excursion boats here. Yeah. I went in there in 1919. Uh, then I played with Kid Ore. And, and then around 1922, I was playing with the Tuxedo Brass Band, Celestan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's when King Oliver sent for me to play second trumpet with him at the Lincoln Gardens. And you were surprised? Well, I was surprised. I was happy because nobody else get me out of New Orleans. <laughs> Chicago was a hotbed of jazz in those days. Uh, we had this great black exodus from the South coming to Chicago for a better way of life, and they needed all this unskilled black labor, porters and red caps and all this sort of stuff. So we had all of these black people coming there, and after they got there and got a good way of life, they sent down south for their entertainment. And that's when King Oliver and General Morton and all these guys came there, and I got to see them. When Armstrong arrived at the Lincoln Gardens in Chicago and heard King Oliver's Creole jazz band for the first time, his first thought was to turn around and go home. He simply wouldn't be good enough. In truth, the young man almost immediately surpassed all the others. At Oliver's first recording session, Armstrong was asked to stand 20 feet behind the other musicians so as not to overwhelm them. Louis was playing the second parts to King's lead. And uh, they would play breaks in things that were incredible. Louis would play the perfect harmony to the second part and anticipate what King was going to play. And then King would put a handkerchief over his right playing hand to see if he could fool uh, the great Louis. I put notes to his lead, whatever he made. Uh, I just, we didn't write it. Did you rehearse it? No, just right. for the moment. You can tell me, you can tell me while the band is playing, what you gonna play on that? What is it? <laughs> I got my notes. So you get and that's cue. why all the musicians used to come around and hear us do that. You know, so that was a secret. Man. I can uh, see why Louis was influenced by Joe Alton because. Joe Oliver played just the same style of Louis Armstrong. He didn't, uh, he wasn't as strong as Louis, because he played, he was a very soft, quiet trumpet player. But he, the same thing that, Louis, that, that um, Oliver played, Louis played, the same style. Louis's dynamic presence could not be contained for long. One night in Chicago, he saw a different kind of artist who inspired him to press further into the realm of entertainment. Bill Bojangles Robinson was the greatest. He didn't need blackface to be funny. He represented comedy plus danger in my race. He was immaculately dressed and funny, and the audience loved him. That's what counted. His material is what counted. Wow, I was sold on him ever since. While playing in Oliver's band, Lewis fell in love with the group's pianist. 
Lil Hardin became the second Mrs. Armstrong. Lil was the belle of the Windy City at that time. Who was I to think that a big, high-powered chick like Leo Hardin, who came to Chicago from Memphis, right out of Fisk University, valedictorian of her class, would get stuck on me? I just couldn't conceive the idea. Lil convinced Lewis to leave Oliver's band and take an offer from band leader Fletcher Henderson in New York. 